Good morning. Hello. Welcome to this morning's webinar. I know we still see some folks rolling in, but we're going to get started. Um, good morning. Thanks for joining Code for America today for our webinar, People Power, Connecting Community to Government During COVID-19. I'm Marissa Levine, Associate Director of Events and Partnerships. My pronouns are she, her, and I am delighted to be facilitating today's conversation. I'm coming to you from San Francisco. Now, since we can't all be in the room together, I'd love to start by asking you all to introduce yourselves in the chat. Tell us where you're tuning in from, what you do, where you work. Let's get a sense of who's in the room. It's a lot more fun that way if we can't be sitting next to each other. If you are not familiar with Code for America, at Code for America, we believe that the two biggest levers for improving people's lives at scale are technology and government. We put them together and we help government work for the people who need it most. To do this, we build digital services that enhance government capabilities and we help others do the same across all levels of government. We organize thousands of volunteers across more than 85 chapters nationwide who improve government in their local communities. These are our brigades, part of our network, who you'll be hearing a lot more about today. And our goal, it's a 21st century government that effectively and equitably serves all Americans. You can learn a lot more at codeforamerica.org. Now, before we begin today's webinar, a few important housekeeping points. Our code of conduct applies as much online as it does in physical spaces. We expect today's session to be a safe and respectful environment for everyone and a place where people can fully express their identities. You can check the chat for a link if you'd like to see our code of conduct. If you're being harassed or notice someone else being harassed or have any other concerns, you can message my colleague Contagia Placide on Zoom chat or send an email to safespace at codeforamerica.org. There are a few ways for you to participate today. Um, as we start now, we're gonna run a quick poll to get a sense of who's in the room, let everybody see what's going on. Um, to engage with us throughout the panel, you'll notice two buttons at the bottom of your Zoom screen, chat and Q&A. Quick tip, if you're on mobile, click on participants to see chat. Like I said before, we welcome your introductions, your comments and your energy throughout today's conversation in the chat. And you can submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button. We'd love if you can include your location and your role so that we have a sense of your perspective and your interest. You can also see other questions that folks have and upvote them so that we know which the most popular ones are in case we can just get to a few. Please note the questions asked in chat will not be considered, so please make sure you're dropping them into Q&A. We also welcome your tweets. Find us at Code for America. You can also stay tuned later this week if you had colleagues who missed or you need to jump off early. We'll be sending out a YouTube video and we would love to have you share with your community. We also have a special thank you to today's partner on this conversation, GitHub. If you're not familiar with GitHub, you likely will be one day if you work in civic tech. It's the platform of choice for over 50 million developers and the world's open source communities, and it's the home for modern software development. GitHub accelerates and transforms the way teams turn ideas into innovative experiences with scalability, management, and compliance that, with, excuse me, the scalability, management, and compliance that agencies expect. It has a community-led approach to DevOps, collaboration, and security, and it empowers developers and government agencies to deliver better software faster through every stage of the life cycle. Plenty of Code for America projects uh, leverage GitHub, and when I got started at Code for America, I really loved looking at the civic tech project search on GitHub, which is on our Brigade website. So thanks, GitHub, for joining us today. And on that note, I'm incredibly proud to bring together today's panel to discuss how people power through our brigade network has advanced Code for America's mission both before and during COVID-19 and will continue for years to come. Now at Code for America, we talk a lot about showing what's possible in government service delivery by creating interactions with government so good they inspire change. Code for America has been showing what's possible for years through services we built like Get CalFresh, Clear My Record, and Get Your Refund. But we're also showing what's possible on a national scale through the people power of our brigade network. This is thousands of volunteers, both technical and non-technical, you don't have to code, I promise, dedicating their free time to improving government services in their local communities, a truly human-centered approach to learning what folks need. Uh, because of that mix of skill sets, brigade members respond to local needs with both technical and low-tech responses. Together, they're leading the conversation on equitable disaster response and recognizing that impacted communities must be centered in their work. From getting tax refunds to helping neighbors, the projects are as diverse as the network itself. The goal for our conversation today is to leave you inspired by the work of our panelists and their brigades and to illuminate the ways that people, whether as a brigade member or through your organizations and governments, can also have an impact on the needs of your community, especially in times of crisis. Now I'll do a quick introduction of our panelists. I'm gonna invite them to turn on their video as I do so, and then we'll jump right in. We've got Yan Yan Choi, co-captain of Code for San Jose. 
Tom Duner, Senior Software Engineer at Code for America, uh, Gregory Johnson, Founder and Executive Director at Code for South Florida and Civic Innovation at Microsoft, Carlos Moreno, Brigade Captain, Code for Tulsa, and Veronica Young, Senior Program Manager for the Brigade Network Program at Code for America. So I'm gonna invite all of them to turn on their videos. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And here they are. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have you and um, welcome. It's nice to actually get people from all over the place. Typically I get to see Tom and Veronica right across from my desk. So this is actually a really nice treat for me. And it looks like I'm gonna help Carlos turn on his video. Give me one second. There we go, see if that helps Carlos. And Yunyun looks like you maybe have the same problem. There we go, awesome. Technology guys, it's the joy of Zoom. If nobody's had a botched Zoom meeting, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, awesome, so Veronica, I'm actually gonna start with you. So Veronica is our senior manager for the Brigade now. Work, and it means that she's got this great 10,000 foot view of the impact of the brigades across the country. So I'd love to have you set the tone a little bit, maybe give us a deeper sense of the function and the scope of the brigade network, as well as like why the brigade network is so well suited to jump in during COVID-19 when it's used to doing all kinds of things throughout the year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Marissa, for having all of us and for um, this time today. Um, so yes, um, as Marissa said, I um, get the pleasure of working with our um, around 80 distributed um, brigade chapters across the country. Um, and so brigade chapters are made up um, of almost entirely volunteers um, who work on projects in their local communities um, in order to um, further access to services in their communities and also working alongside nonprofits um, in order to create projects to um, further those initiatives. Um, and so um, we really have the pleasure of being able to work with a network of folks who are working on projects in their communities and then actually can knowledge share with other brigades across the country and other civic technologists and folks that are interested um, in various places um, to have impact on a broad scale. Um, so particularly this year, um, we saw that um, when COVID-19 hit, um, this was just kind of the a, a great example of how the network can kick into action. Um, we've done rapid response work in the past. So in particular, um, we've had a number of projects around the hurricanes that have hit um, over the last few years, um, starting with Hurricane Harvey and the response to that, um, creating information sites where people can find information about food and shelter, um, and what needs are present um, when a hurricane hits, um, and then being able to redeploy essentially those projects um, when other hurricanes have hit over the years. Um, and also there's been work to um, help in prevention of fires um, here in California. Um, and then um, this network really was able to be redeployed again in response to COVID. Um, so at that time, um, we were able to create very quickly structures to be able to to um, combat some of the needs that were coming about in our communities, particularly um, in the social um, safety net. Um, and so a lot of the projects um, focused around being able to find food for your families um, and other um, basic services um, that are hard to come by in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so um, some of those structures that we were able to create were Slack channels that were dedicated to certain types of projects. There was a COVID-19 core working group made up of uh, members across the country, including Gregory here, um, who were able to um, really lead the initiatives on what projects were happening, putting all of that information into one place and then knowledge sharing about, um, about different aspects of those projects so that those aspects could be useful across the country. Um, and then having weekly stand-up calls so that people could find out more information and participate. Um, and I think it's also important to note that the National Advisory Council played a key part in making sure that our rapid response work um, was part of our four priority action areas for the year. So our goals are really to be able to highlight some of this work and then create tools and resources so that folks across the country can engage in these projects um, as, as they're needed for their communities. Veronica, have you seen a big uptick in people reaching out to get engaged? I know that when COVID-19 hit, even just in my own personal community, we all had the sense of what can I do? And I feel like the more I learn about the brigades at, at Code for America, it's a great answer to what can I do? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think I, my background is in organizing, um, particularly political organizing, and a lot of the issues that you face are trying to get people interested enough to um, be a part of the solution in their communities and to volunteer their time. Um, and I think that we have a really unique and special aspect of Code for America that we have so many people that are so excited to jump in. And a lot of the issues are really about how can people plug in in very ways versus trying to recruit people to be interested and get it get excited I mean in this in this circumstance um, people are really wanting to be of, of service and help in their communities um, so yes there is a ton of um, interest and excitement um, around being able to be a part of the solution um, particularly in response to COVID-19 um, and I think that the structures that I mentioned before were really great ways um, for people to be able to find tangible ways to plug in. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been, I've been really energized. I pop into those slacks myself and just the volume of conversations and action that take place every day is overwhelming in a good way to me. <laughs> um, so before I bring in the other panelists to um, share some of the great projects that they're working on, I like to start with a quick lightning round. Don't want any of you sitting quietly because that's the most boring way to do a panel. Um, so I'm going to start and I'll call on each of you, but I'd love for you to each share how you came to this work of being a part of um, the brigades and a part of Code for America. Like what, what inspired you? Uh, Tom, I'm going to start with you because I see you in my upper left hand corner. Sounds good. Hi everyone, I'm Tom, uh, senior software engineer uh, at Code for America. I got involved uh, originally by showing up at a brigade meetup one night uh, in my hometown of Oakland, got to know the people, became a fellow with Code for America, I see some uh, some folks that I worked with on the fellowship project and then at, uh, came on on staff after that. Awesome, and we'll be sure to share out some information about the fellowship program because Gregory can also speak to that, but that's another great way to get involved in the network. Uh, Gregory, over to you. Hey guys, Gregory, uh, founder of Code for South Florida. I got involved in the brigade in um, 2013. I also come from an organizing uh, as well as technical background and um, for me, it was just about kind of working on a project that was less about um, private sector and more about helping people. And I stuck with it ever since of, I'm like six years in now. Awesome, thanks Gregory. Uh, Yan Yan. Hi, good morning, I'm Yan Yan. Um, I'm one of the captains of Code for San Jose. Um, I got involved probably about six years ago, which is kind of when Code for San Jose uh, first got started. Um, I just moved back to San Jose from Sacramento and connected with uh, one of the founders, um, Kaylin, um, who told me about Code for San Jose. And I just wanted to find a way to get involved with my local community. And um, at first I wasn't involved in anything really technical. It's mostly around open data policy advocacy. Awesome. And Carlos, last but not least. Yeah, so um, I was volunteered. Um, my friend Luke Crouch, who works uh, for uh, Mozilla, uh, saw um, Jen Polka's TED Talk. And, you know, he sent it to me and he's like, you really got to see this. Because um, he knew that I was really involved in the community and community organizing, especially around um, things like transportation issues and social justice issues. And so I got really excited and I was like, how can we um, help here in Tulsa? And he's like, well, I just signed you up to be a co-founder of the Code for Tulsa Brigade. So congratulations, um, you're in this already because uh, I already sent the application to Jen. Um, so <laughs> I didn't know what I was diving into, but, um, but we've been going strong ever since 2012. So we're really, we're really happy. Awesome. Well, I love hearing these threads, though, of like folks really wanting to get a sense of how they can have impact in their local communities where you guys really know the problems that people are facing as well as the best ways to plug in. Because I will say Veronica is one of the most connected people I know, but she's not going to know everyone in Tulsa or everyone in Miami. And so the boots on the ground and the ability for brigade leaders, whether they volunteered or were voluntold, um, is really incredible to see as well as the thread coming in from Yanin of you don't have to be technical. Um, I think everybody hears Code for America and immediately goes, 
was, oh, if I don't code, if I'm not a developer, how can I help? And what I'm excited to hear from all three of these panelists presenting projects is that there are a lot of ways for people to plug in, that it's more about the passion for making a change um, and coming together with other folks with other diverse skills and less about knowing the latest coding language. I promise you, I do not know any of those and I still feel like a good part of Code for America. So before we get into a lot of other conversation, what I really want to do is showcase some of the projects that people are working on because I think it gives you the best sense of the unique ways that people are impacting their communities through brigades. And so I am going to hand it over to folks. We're going to hear a little bit about the problems that they were tackling, any of like the challenges, like obviously these are tough problems. If they were easy, they wouldn't have been they would have been solved already um, and what some of the current product and the future roadmap looks like um, as well as maybe share how folks can get involved and what the current team looks like to make it seem pretty accessible to you. Um, we're going to go east to west. Uh, each of our panelists will have a few minutes and so we're going to go Gregory in Miami, Carlos in Tulsa, and then Yanin in San Jose. So Gregory over to you. Sure thing. Let me share my screen. So just checking, can everybody see my screen? All right, so yeah, my name is Gregory again I'm with Code for South Florida, and I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about our project called evictionprotection.org. Um, Code for South Florida is a regional um, nonprofit that works across three counties in South Florida, um, which are the top in terms of population, uh, Miami-Dade, Broward County, and Palm Beach. So the orig origin story of like how we got to this is we know this pandemic has impacted people in many ways. One of the ways that we saw that was really kind of like important was millions of Florida residents have lost their jobs and sources of income. And as a result, you have a hard time paying rent. Uh, the federal government passed a law called the CARES Act that protects tenants um, from uh, getting evicted from their properties. And for this particular project, we were reached out by one of our nonprofit community partners we've worked with called Community Justice Project. They're a network of lawyers who basically saw what was happening and said, hey, we want to build this tool that kind of addresses this um, pain point. Would you be willing to kind of mobilize a team of volunteers who could work on it? And we had a community leader step up, Greg Bloom, who mobilized a team of about like 10 or 15 people through open hack nights and reaching out and setting up times to do either like video conference calls to work on this project. And that's how it kind of got started. So people ask me all the time, what is eviction protection? How does it work? So if you go on the website right now, it shows you um, basically all 67 counties in Florida. You can search by county based on your zip code and see what eviction protection policies are in your area. And these may change over time. So we make sure to kind of give you like a overview of what this looks like and then a reference link of how to get to that. Two, you see a, a map of about 10,000 properties that we open sourced and put up, um, all showing that they're protected from getting evicted based on what's happening in this pandemic. Three, you can make an action item, which is you can go to norent.org, another tool, um, which allows people to kind of write a letter to their landlord if they're a renter. Um, with a pre kind of like hand template of what you can say if you can't earn it, unable to pay rent. And last, you see a resource um, for renters about like reaching out and getting like legal assistance if you may need that um, all kind of like consist of areas here in Florida. If you go to the website today, you'll see check your county eviction policy. Um, I went ahead and took a snippet of Miami Dade County and it breaks down eviction suspended. It breaks down evictions that are active and it goes through kind of active cases based on what your county is. And then this is the mapping feature that the team built. So I want to touch on a couple of like metrics that we use at Code for South Florida to kind of like rank how well this project went. For this, we got an opportunity to work with five nonprofit organizations to get data and um, mobilize around this. We got about 25 plus volunteers that work technical and non-technical to help organize it. And in our first month, which was a couple months back, we got 5,000 plus people that were web visitors for the eviction protection tool. We then open sourced um, the feature for the uh, search by county, um, which anybody can find on our Code for South um, GitHub. 
And I would like to wrap it up of like what's next for us. So for us in Q3, we have a couple of things that are pending and brewing. One is we are sunsetting um, our other donor management tools like DonorBox and other things in favor of GitHub sponsors. GitHub sponsors has an individual and organizational view where you can basically raise money for projects that you're working on through GitHub. And we find it just really easy for people to tap in and understand what projects that are going on and how they can kind of like donate towards that and see really working and being developed in real time. We'll be introducing our new volunteer model with employers that we're really excited about working with the private sector to bring more people to work on tech for social impact projects. And lastly, we'll be introducing our data collaborative initiative with government partners that we're really excited about here in Miami-Dade and South Florida. One of those projects is around air quality. And um, yeah, we're really just excited to kind of take this momentum. We see the eviction protection project is one that's gonna be continued to be maintained by Community Justice Project. And if you have any questions related to this, you can reach out to us at team at coforsouth.com if you wanna be a volunteer or interested in being a potential partner. And if you work in the government or funding space, happy to have a conversation about how we're looking at some of our partnerships and measuring success and impact, as well as handing off projects to some of our government partners so they can work on them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gregory. Um, and just by also some way of context, which is helpful, the brigades that are across the country all take many forms. We've got brigades that have been around for a really long time, brigades that sometimes have their own nonprofit structure. Gregory's is a great example of a, a very robust brigade that is um, down in South Florida, which is awesome. Um, and you definitely get a sense of the different ways that folks can partner. Um, Gregory, I have a question for you. Just one quick follow up. And I know that this is something we think about a lot. How are you connecting with users? We talk a lot about user research and kind of the human-centered approach um, at Code for America. How have you been able to interact with the people who need your services the most? Sure, so we actually use the user research guide that Code for America has. I don't know if it's still in draft mode or not, but we introduced that to our team. Uh, we have a civic user testing group that we operate in. And that's kind of the core of how we operate in many things. For instance, in our data collaborative initiative, as we kind of pilot these sensors, the thing that we put in all of our partners kind of like face is we need to make sure we're getting this in front of real people that can give feedback to it. And some of the volunteers, that's the role that they played. If you're non-technical, hey, look at this website, look at this feature, tell us what you think, share it with your friends, and kind of like yep, leveraging that guide to get feedback. That way we make sure we're building things that actually matter. So that's how we look at it. Nice shout out. Our qualitative research team is going to be like sending like lots of heart emojis over to Gregory later. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Gregory. Um, we're going to move on to the next two presentations and then we'll have some chance to hear a little bit more about the approach um, as well as if you have specific questions for any of our panelists, please put them in Q&A and we'll try to get to them at the end too. So Carlos, you are up. Carlos Moreno from Tulsa. Carlos Moreno from Tulsa. Carlos, you're muted. Oh, here we go. All right, can everybody hear me now? Yep. Awesome. Uh, my name is Carlos Moreno. I am the in-house graphic designer for a Head Start agency here in Tulsa, and I am also the brigade captain for code for Tulsa. We want to share a project um, that we built um, and it is a, a screener for the SNAP program. So for those of you who don't know, um, SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's basically a reboot of the food stamp program um, that you might remember from the 30s and 40s. Um, and it was kind of rebooted in the 70s. And it basically just provides food benefits for um, qualifying families based on their need and the number of people in their household um, I want to give a few shout outs to all the volunteers who worked on this project. Um, I am not a programmer. Um, people like Jim Gillespie and Chris Stevenson and Chris Doe were the, were the programmers on this project. Um, there were a lot of volunteers who worked on the sort of uh, policy aspects of SNAP and how someone qualifies. There's a lot of folks who volunteered um, on the user side of things, making sure that the, that the um, tool that we built was uh, easy for people to use. Um, and so this is actually a project that um, we kicked off um, in about the summer of 2018 and worked a long time on it and it just launched. 
um, pretty recently, kind of right on time, um, when schools are starting to plan for spring break. And um, of course, in Tulsa, our schools never came back from spring break. Um, so it's kind of a kind of good timing. Because um, at the time, uh, the Oklahoma Department of Human Services, which administers the SNAP program here in Oklahoma, um, they started getting overwhelmed with a bunch of calls and a bunch of questions. Um, families really ha found the process to apply for SNAP very difficult. Um, and they were kind of flooding the office with questions and phone calls and emails. Everybody was sort of overwhelmed and confused. Um, and so, you know, as as people who want to help and as programmers, our first instinct was to kind of just dive in and say, oh, we can, we can build a better mousetrap, you know, we can build this better website and just launched it for, won't launch it for everybody. And as we really got into the weeds and started understanding the policies and understanding the experiences of people who were trying to apply for SNAP, we really kind of took a step back and um, kind of thought about a different approach. Um, and you know, as we learned from the Get Cal Fresh program in California, um, you know, this, this issue is important um, now more than ever. We're starting to see um, tons of people who are, um, you know, in need of things like food assistance and housing assistance. So we really knew that this uh, project that we were about to launch was getting um, pretty urgent. And so, um, we really wanted to build a tool that not only was easy for um, families to use, but sort of reduced the administrative burden on the Oklahoma DHS so they could process more cases. And so when we started this pro project, we um, really quickly put together a list of sort of must haves. Um, we wanted the project to be mobile friendly, all of our families, um, uh, over half of them were using their cell phones to access things like housing benefits and food benefits. Um, we wanted it to be very simple. We wanted it to be bilingual and the ability to, so right now it's available in Spanish and English, um, but we wanted the availability to add more languages in the future. Um, we wanted Hunger Free Oklahoma, which was our nonprofit partner, um, to very easily be able to update the information so that the, the um, the information that families were receiving was accurate and up to date. Um, and we wanted to build a tool that not only was easy for users, but also, um, and this was kind of the most important aspect of the project, um, put somebody um, in touch with that family that could walk them through the rest of the process. So it wasn't just a, hey, you qualify for SNAP, or hey, you don't qualify for SNAP, good luck. Um, you know, we really wanted to provide somebody with, you know, what are the next steps and how to move forward. Um, and so here is our SNAP screening tool. I've got the URL there at the top. You can kind of take a little test drive for yourself if you'd like. Um, again, sort of mobile friendly, very simple, um, lots of graphics and icons to guide people through the process. Um, and we also used GitHub to, um, to build the project on. And in addition, um, we worked with Hunger Free Oklahoma um, to also use GitHub. And we sort of showed them around, gave them a little tutorial on some basic GitHub um, best practices, and especially used the documentation feature um, for their staff to be able to do things like um, update the uh, contact database uh, using Google Sheets and kind of collaborate with us uh, through GitHub. So that was a really useful um, tool to use as we were building this um, project. And so um, this was a very specific pilot with um, Hunger Free Oklahoma and the Tulsa Public School System. And so in the future, what we're sort of envisioning um, is to be able to roll this project out and make it available for every state. Um, we can make the screener a little bit generic, sort of take out all the Tulsa-centric um, information um, and provide sort of two versions of the screener, one that's more generic, but one that also sort of keeps this referral aspect going to it. 
Um, and the third thing, which is the most exciting thing, is throughout through the process and as we were getting it launched, we found out um, that another organization, 18F, had come up with an API um, that has every single state's qualification um, requirements for the food stamp program. Um, so we're in the beginning of phases and working with Alexander Subble to um, kind of um, test out their API and pilot it and see how it works. Um, and if we can get it up and running for Oklahoma, um, I'd be really excited about getting it up and running for everyone. Um, so hello to um, everybody out there from Tulsa. And if you'd um, like to jump in and help out, um, and talk about how you might be able to implement a SNAP screener in your state, um, then let me know. And thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carlos. And I feel like this is a great example of the potential to scale, which is something I kind of wanted to talk about before, which is that the brigades and the civic tech space don't really live in a vacuum. The fact that there's a network literally what we call our community of brigades and fellowship really speaks so strongly to being able to find out and re-leverage things in different ways. And so I love hearing you talk about this as not just something for Tulsa, although you built it specifically for a community and with a community that needs it, but the, the combination of technology and relationships could send this to the moon or at least all 50 states. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and uh, one of our most successful projects, which was uh, CourtBot, um, we actually redeployed from a fellowship program in Atlanta. And we were able to collaborate with Code for Anchorage. Um, shout out to Code for Anchorage. <laughs> um, and uh, so that really sort of right, right off the bat, you know, we had this sort of collaborative spirit of, you know, we're forking projects from other brigades and we want other brigades to fork our projects as well. So um, yeah, very, um, very community oriented in that sense. Very different from the, the, the actual startup space. I did not feel this energy when I worked in startups. <laughs> so it's a very different. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, Carlos. And if you guys have specific questions for Carlos, drop them in the chat. Um, and now we are over in my coast, in my time zone, and over to Yanyin Choi from San Jose. Hello, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see that? Yep, just go into full present mode. Hi everyone, again, uh, my name is Yanin. I am one of the co-captains of Code for San Jose. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, a couple of our COVID-19 projects. So one of them um, was to basically help design information to help San Jose residents navigate um, issues related to COVID-19, maybe helping with employment services or figuring out how to pay for rent and mortgage or getting tested. Um, we had volunteers basically curate content and refine translations um, for a resident assistant chatbot, which went live um, on SiliconValleyStrong.org in mid to late April 2020. So a bit about the project. Um, our volunteers basically con conducted surveys and interviews and defined a list of uh, intents or answers um, that the chatbot can provide. They helped curate content, um, and after it was launched in April 2020, um, another group of volunteers uh, helped refine uh, translations. Um, the chatbot's available in uh, Vietnamese and in Spanish as well. Um, our volunteers used uh, basically a lot of content strategy skills, such as stakeholder relationships, the data analysis, conversation design, as well as project management and uh, translation. And they use um, Google Forms and Google Sheets to um, basically do this research, although they started, um, eventually started editing the information just directly in the back end in Heroku. Um, our project partners that we worked with um, is the City of San Jose uh, MOTI, which stands for Mayor, Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation, uh, specifically a Porvin Clay. 
um, they basically reached out to us in early April and I started recruiting volunteers. Um, and we're especially grateful for all our volunteers. Ken Knight was our volunteer lead and helped coordinate a team of three folks um, to work on content design and research, uh, including uh, my colleagues that serve us now where I work, Fernando Joffrey and Morgan Quinn, as well as Sarah Hudson, who is a former US Digital Service Fellow. And we had a number of our volunteers um, help with translation refinement, Ron, Min, Emily, and Cesar. Some of the challenges that the content design team um, kind of faced was trying to figure out conversation design and thinking about what's the happy path that we want users to follow to get to a specific answer. Um, if users are having trouble navigating um, the chatbot, what's the repair path? How do we get people to reframe the question before they drop off not, and not use the chatbot anymore? And the third thing was um, to help keep the language accessible for everybody at a sort of like a middle school reading level. Um, we wanted to accommodate immigrants and EL ESL speakers, uh, even though we did provide the chatbot in Vietnamese and Spanish, but making the language accessible to everybody um, was a big priority. Um, but the challenge was also making sure we maintain a level of professionalism and, you know, using standard government jargon, um, which was tricky, uh, but um, I'm going to give you a quick demo of what the chatbot looks like. Um, so this is the Silicon Valley Strong website. On the bottom right, if you click on the chatbot, it will pop up. And um, as you can see, there's some top questions, but let's say maybe you're trying to figure out something related to testing. Um, so um, you just type in kind of like your phrase and then um, some sort of like question and answer will pop up with some more information. Um, so going back to presentation, the other uh, tool that we worked on was Find Free Food Near Me. Um, again, the city of San Jose reached out to us, uh, specifically folks from the IT department, Julie Kim and Joel Clark. Um, they wanted us to help them uh, create a tool to help residents look up free meal and groceries in Santa Clara County to get through the COVID-19 crisis. So um, at the beginning, uh, they already had a lot of um, things for us to work with. Um, they gave us mockups uh, that were designed with Figma, as well as an existing code base that was built with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and CodeCast framework. And what we did was we wanted to address some of their priorities, which was make it mobile responsive, make sure we improve the web accessibility, um, and also improve the UX by making the design fit um, what was um, designed in the mockup. And we also refactored the code. Um, we wanted to simplify it a bit so that um, new volunteers going forward didn't really have to learn more about a new framework. And so we just refactored it. Um, and so now it's just HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and jQuery. Um, and we're very thankful for um, our fellow volunteers. Uh, I contributed to some of the code, um, as well as Dane Olson and Kevin Mershon. Um, and our project is actually open sourced. Uh, we put it on GitHub and um, it went live in May, but we kind of uh, continue to um, make some tweaks here and there. Uh, the city of San Jose will either reach out to us on Slack or sometimes write a GitHub issue if they find some sort of problem that they need help with fixing. Uh, so the initial site on the left, you can see looked like that. And uh, the new tool on the right, it's a screenshot of what the current tool is, um, uh, looks like that. And it's also available on the siliconvalleystrong.org uh, website, um, which is a project under the city of San Jose mayor's office. Um, I encourage everyone, if you're interested in collaborating or just chatting about ideas, um, please uh, join us for a virtual meetup. We typically meet twice a month and we actually have a meetup tonight, um, 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, you can also go to our website to learn more information or submit a project idea um, and feel free to send me an email um, if you are interested in collaborating. Thank you so much.
Awesome. Thanks so much, Yanine. And I feel like you touched on a lot of the questions that I'm actually seeing people ask in chat around how do you get involved and can I do something if I'm not a developer and some things about language, which is really great. And so I love that you illustrated just how important easy access is to things. I think we talk a lot at Code for America. I know we talked in our prep call around how like fancy tech is not the answer. And it's really cool to see how you leveraged simple things and really trying to make sure that something was accessible as opposed to sparkly necessarily for people to get what they needed. Um, when you, as you guys are thinking, and I think one request for you, Yanin, would you drop links to what you just shared in the chat? I know everybody's really eager to kind of go play with some of the sites that everybody's sharing. So that would be awesome too. Yeah, definitely. And a link to the meetup tonight would be excellent. <laughs> There's a, if you're feeling excited and actionable, now is the time, folks. Um, because we are starting to get a little short on time, I'm going to jump over to Tom Dooner, who's going to share about a really great collective action project that's going on. Folks who are dropping questions into the q and I'll probably try to bundle those in for our panelists afterwards, because I've got a few things I want to touch on with them as well. Um, and our panelists may also jump into Q&A to answer some of those for you, too. Um, but with that, thank you, Yanin, and over to Tom Dooner. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm going to screen share and Marissa, please let me know if you cannot see this. Uh, assuming everything's working here. Hello, everybody. I'm Tom Dooner. I'm the senior software engineer on the Brigade Network team at Code for America. And so by now you've heard a lot, three great stories of the great work that Code for America brigades are doing every week. Um, I want to tell you a story of how brigade members across the country stepped up to help people get their tax refunds and their stimulus checks in this time of need. Um, so what is so? there's a tool called Get Your Refund, uh, and what is that? At Code for America, our staff product teams, we are also working on products in addition to kind of how the brigades uh, work on projects. So there's a, there's a natural connection between what we're doing at Code for America staff and what brigade members, volunteers nationwide are working on. Uh, so uh, the story today is about how we built a connection between those groups of people. And Get Your Refund was the first example of this. We started working on Get Your Refund in late 2019 uh, after learning how many people rely on the Earned Income Tax Credit, or EITC, uh, but don't receive it because of the barrier of filing taxes. Uh, even people who do file taxes, who are able to make it over the barrier, oftentimes will end up, uh, will often end up paying half of their tax refund to a, a for-profit tax preparation service. Uh, and uh, we think that that is not ideal. So we built getyourrefund.org to connect people with tax preparation services that are free, trustworthy, clarifying, thorough, and accessible, provided by IRS certified volunteers throughout the country. We partner with, uh, we partner with, uh, with providers in the IRS's Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, also known as VITA, to directly help these users. So uh, this is the Get Your Refund product. Um, I actually don't want to talk too much about it. You can check it out at getyourrefund.org. Um, and also our code is open source and available at github.com slash code for America. Uh, so what, what I want to, but what I do want to talk about today is how the movement of civic technology and the brigade network uh, has met the need uh, for products like this. And uh, we, we published a, blog post about this, which Marissa can drop a link to in the chat, or I will after this. Um, but what I want to highlight today is how uh, people power and online collaboration makes this possible. When coronavirus forced VITA sites, which normally provides in-person tax clinics to all shut down, almost overnight the VITA program ground to a halt. There was, they were not able to help the low-income people in their communities access their free services to get up to $7,000 in federal, state, and local tax credits. Uh, you know, these clients really need those credits and, you know, and turning to a for-profit tax preparation company is less than ideal. So this was an incredible opportunity for us to empower VITA organizations and to directly help many people who rely on VITA's services, but only if we could scale up to meet the moment. To give some idea, uh, we, of, of the scale that would be required, we initially intended to to do the entire tax season with only four VITA partners uh, because, of, uh, because we wanted a relatively small pilot to begin with. But almost overnight when coronavirus uh, affected all of these sites, we now, we now had over a hundred 
vital organizations expressing interest in get your refund. And so we knew that if we were going to help as many people as possible, we needed to we needed people power to help meet that need. And so that's where the get your refund volunteer team comes in. And so this is a group of star volunteers from across the country, um, some of whom were brand new to the brigade network, some of whom had been around for a while. Um, I don't I think Carlos is in this picture, but Carlos was involved as well, um, and Gregory as well. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the idea here is that get your refund volunteers help us meet that need for scale by, uh, by taking the lead on onboarding new partners, by providing the community-based VITA organizations with much needed advice, training, and in some cases, just a friendly face, a local face, uh, to help them through the process. Get Your Refund volunteers produce training materials. They've produced a series of dozen YouTube videos that they update about how to use the product, how to get, how to, how to, you know, how, how to train your staff to, to, uh, to help clients with the product and uh, produce documentation, frequently asked questions, that kind of thing. And Get Your Refund volunteers also help serve clients directly. They step into the, our live chat functionality where users have ask their tax questions or just want to know how they can claim their stimulus funding. And, uh, and so one example of this all coming together is uh, actually happened in Miami. It's a, a story about how, uh, you know, how, how Gregory and as captain of Code for South Florida and Code for Miami uh, brought this work used, uh, was able to use the processes we developed to bring on new partners in Miami, train them, support them. And uh, now I think we started with four partners in Miami and now we're, I think we're gonna be up to six soon. And, uh, and so I think uh, just kind of this national work can have very local impact as well. And so, uh, and I should also say, I saw a couple, uh, couple folks from the volunteer team on the call today. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, so thank you for all the work that you've done and uh, we're, so grateful for the 40 or more active volunteers that we have, and we've had over 100 people so far um, on the volunteer team at one point or another. And so tax day is coming up soon. I uh, hate to say it because I still have not done my taxes, but tax day is coming up soon. And so we are looking forward to next season and kind of the, the off season, so to speak, although it's likely that uh, that many of these VITA providers will continue working past the deadline. Uh, and we're looking back at the success of being able to onboard dozens of new partners to help thousands and hopefully tens of thousands more clients because of the volunteer effort that everyone has put in. Uh, and so just, yeah, incredible work to the Get Your Refund volunteer team. And I think I speak for all of us when I say we're looking forward to building off this work next year to expand the breadth of the team and integrate it more closely with VITA next year so that we can help as many people get their refunds. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Tom, so much. And Tom, if there are additional opportunities now, maybe you can drop in ways that folks can get involved. Um, I would say that for any of these projects, a first step is always get involved with your local brigade because brigades are going to be a funnel to anything that's kind of a little bit more out of the ordinary, um, like what Tom's working on. But we're seeing a lot more around collective action and you'll actually hear um, some of that from um, Veronica uh, before we end today's program. But so with a little bit of time left, I have a couple more questions for our panelists. I'll actually ask all of our panelists to turn their video back on and join us because I've got questions for all of you. Um, and the two questions that I have, and I'll, I'll jump to different folks are, after having seen all of these different projects, if a couple of you can chime in, what does it look like to join a brigade? Because I'm really hoping that there are people on this chat who are like, yes, I'm excited. I want to do it tonight. How do I do it? Where do I sign up? Um, and so I would love maybe Carlos, if you want to kick that one off. And then if anybody else wants to chime in, that would be great. But um, and Veronica and Yanin, feel free to turn your video on as well. Yeah, I mean, I got to be honest and say that, um, you know, for us, more inclusion um, and more feeling a sense uh, um, that people can be welcome into the brigade is something that is a recent, has been a recent challenge for us. Um, we were called out a couple of years ago for the brigade being sort of this collective of tech bros. Um, and, you know, we really had to look deep within ourselves and ask, you know, what is it about our meetings? What is it about our 
events and who were allowing to give presentations and who were asking to speak um and look at all of that um and figure out how we can make changes so that um we can make sure that everyone feels welcome and included um so um you know it's it's not perfect it's an ongoing process and it's uh it's been a it's been a long road um i'm proud to say though that um of the five or six projects that i can think of off the top of my head um, they're now all being led by women, so I'm very proud of that. Um, certainly not perfect, and certainly not, uh, we have a long way to go, um, but we're sort of just now kind of starting to put into place um, things like <clears throat> we started um, a welcome um, repo on GitHub so that people can sort of get oriented into what the brigade, what our brigade is all about and the things that we are focusing on and um, a little bit about the projects that we're working on. So that that even is still a work in progress um, as we continue to build that. Um, and and of course, everything going virtual lately has has been a challenge as well. So um, so yeah, it's it's not easy, but we're trying um, and um, just kind of just trying to get better day by day. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that transparency. And I can also say that I've seen so much iteration that the, the spirit of iterative work and change and accepting feedback and looking for community feedback is something I've found to be so strong in Code for America and the brigades. Going to my first Brigade Congress last year, I felt that energy of people just really being open to trying and learning and getting feedback. And to me, that's been an incredible part of watching this community. Um, Gregory or Yanin, does anybody want to chime in on that? And then I've got one more question um, that I want to field to the group too. Any takers? No, nobody wants to rock, paper, scissors. We can move on to the next one too. Um, Gregory, go ahead. <laughs> so the best way is to go to code for south for us, codeforsouth.com and then hit volunteers. Um, we've been very intentional. We've, we did a big restructuring of how we operate. So the way we set it up is you sign up to that volunteer, the way the process works, you get like a follow-up email with all the details of diving in and we have pathways. So it's like, are you technical? Are you non-technical? Um, for us in Miami, because of where we are and, and just in South Florida, we have a mix of women, men, it doesn't matter, race, different race. So we also set a code of conduct up based on the Code for America's model. And in the volunteer step, we actually ask you to make sure that you check and read this. And we have a list of all the people that have done that to make sure that we're kind of making sure the space is open for all. Um, we're also very, um, for like leadership and like paid staff, we make sure it's very transparent. Like if you're joining this team, everybody kind of gets an understanding of who gets paid what. So everybody in the same role gets, uh, gets paid uh, the same thing. And um, based on experience that may change, as well as um, we're, we're looking to bring on a, a woman leader in the space for Broward because we recognize that it's just super important to make sure we have a diverse leadership. Right now we have all male team. So we're really excited to bring that on in the next two weeks. And um, if you're a volunteer, you just wanted to kind of see how that looks like, I just recommend going to coforsouth.com, looking at volunteer and you can get a little taste of how our system works. Awesome. Sounds like maybe Carlos and Gregory have some talking. We can, everybody can be learning about different onboarding experiences. I know that there's a lot of really cool um, work that goes in and a lot of things that Veronica and Tom and other folks on our network um, team at Code for America really help to make sure um, folks are able to implement. Um, I've got one more question and I think we definitely see some government folks on here and I know you're probably thinking if you work for a community organization or a government, how can you best partner? Um, and I think I want to toss that one over to Yanina, maybe Veronica um, or Tom, if you want to jump in to kind of share, like, what does that look like if somebody wants to work with you? Because I think that that's, that's really where the scale and the impact um, come into play. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can speak to that. Um, I mean, both of the projects I just mentioned, uh, it was a result of the city of San Jose actually reaching out to us, but we already have um, a lot of prior built relationships with the city of San Jose. Um, especially since one of our co-founders um, used to work with the city of San Jose's innovation department. Um, but yeah, we we always love partnering with government folks or nonprofit folks. And um, typically the process is somebody usually knows somebody on the leadership team. Um, but we also try to actively reach out to uh, potential partners and see if people will come speak to our brigade and share more about what departments are doing so that we can be more aware of all of the different 
roles that departments and agencies play or nonprofits um, in the community. Uh, thanks so much, Yanine. And then uh, Veronica, I'm going to toss to you because I know we've got a really exciting opportunity coming up from Code for America that ties pretty strongly to this. Yes, absolutely. Um, so on September 12th, we'll be holding our eighth annual National Day of Civic Hacking. Um, and National Day of Civic Hacking is really a great way to engage with the network and the work that um, brigades across the country are doing. Um, so this year, the focus will be on COVID-19 response and the social safety net. Um, and we'll have um, at least three guided actions in which folks can participate um, to be able to be part of that work. Um, Carlos is on the National Day of Civic Hacking Committee, um, and there's a committee working right now to um, make sure that there are various pathways for entry. Um, so one thing that I want to highlight um, that has been mentioned and um, Yanin really spoke to is that you don't have to be a technologist to participate, and National Day of Civic Hacking is a great way to participate um, in these actions without necessarily feeling like you're committing to leading a whole project or something like that. So it's um, definitely a great way to be involved and be part of the work um, and also see what some of the impact that um, you can have um, being part of um, these projects that will be created. Um, so projects may be around redeploying a um, current social safety net project um, that has been created and used in response to COVID-19. Um, there could be um, ways to participate in advocacy efforts um, to further policy that um, helps folks in your community um, access the social safety net. Um, we could be looking at the impact of COVID in our communities and how that um, ties against the um, social safety net blueprint that Code for America has, um, has come out with and seeing how our communities um, and their current services are able to match up um, to the principles that we've laid out. So there's lots of different um, avenues for participation um, and it'll be really fun. Last year we had over a thousand people um, being part of these events um, in person. We'll be online this year but I think that makes even um, another way to connect with folks across the country in a way that you don't normally get to. Awesome. Thank you so much. We, like I said, once you're excited, it's good just to know where you can head. So between signing up to go to Camp, uh, Code for San Jose's meetup tonight or checking out our National Day of Civic Hacking website, um, that's really where we're at. Um, so we are just about at time. I know that it's hard to jump from webinar back into meetings. So I want to take a second and thank our excellent panelists, Yan Yin Choi from Code for San Jose, Carlos Moreno from Code for Tulsa, um, Gregory Johnson from Code for South Florida, and Veronica Young and Tom Duner, both from Code for America. America. We really appreciate you guys joining us today and giving us some kind of hope and momentum for all of the cool things that are going on in our communities and that, that have the capacity to really impact folks. Um, for those of you jumping off, today's webinar has been recorded and it will be shared on YouTube in the coming days. So definitely encourage you to keep an eye out for that. Um, you can visit us online. We are at codeforamerica.org. We've got lots of great content, opportunities to support our work. And of course we are on Twitter. Um, so thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event next week around modernizing Congress. Have a great day. Thank you.